Call to order the special meeting for City of East Grand Forks, Tuesday, July 25th, is now 5 o'clock. Would the city clerk please call roll? Mayor C. Gander? Here. Council President Mark Olson? Here. Council Vice President Chad Grassel? Here. Council Members Clarence Vetter? Here. Mike Parkshivinsky? Here. Tim Rayapel? Here. Henry Tweeden? Here. Mark Demers? Present. Does the term quorum? Number one, consider allocating funding for the westerly 162 feet of Brandon Boulevard paving project. Is there a motion? I move. We approve. Second. Moved by Pachavinsky, second by Tweeten. Yeah. You want to approve up to a dollar amount? Consider it. Uh, I believe there's a placeholder for $25,000. Want to restate Can your motion then? Uh, and this this is conditioned upon written contracts with the eight parcels on Brad or the Laurel. Up to eight. Up to eight. <laughs> okay. And the developer. What did you say, Mark? I said and the developer or not. Uh, I'm sorry. Correct. Yes. Yes, and the developer. I'm fine with that. Restate your motion. The okay. Whole thing. I move that we allocate the twenty-five thousand dollars funds conditioned upon written contracts with up to eight of the parcels on Laurel, including uh, a contribution from the developer. You fine with that, then, right? Yes. So we have a first by Pachavinsky, second by Mr. Tweeden. Discussion, Mr. Mayor Gander. On um, this project of paving on Brandon Boulevard, Nate Circle, and Crystal Circle has turned into a bit of a cluster, and I take responsibility for that. And the problem is that a project like this becomes a little more clear as you get immersed into it, and so the farther you get into it, you learn as you go. Uh, on April 18, 2017, 2017, our engineer gave us the option of distributing part of the cost of the project onto Laurel Drive as an end benefit, or having the project completely paid for by the folks on Brandon, Nate, and Crystal. In our first calculation, if we would have done the end benefit onto the families on Laurel, the cost would have been over $6,000 per family, and we voted it down. And the reason for that, we can all have our own idea, but we did vote it down. So we went forward with the plan of having the families on Brandon, Nate Circle, and Crystal pay for the whole project. According to projections at that time, their cost of special assessments just for the paving portion would have been in the twenty to thirty thousand dollars per property. With that proposal, the owners of nine of the lots came forward with an appeal. They said if it went forward, they would contest it, and the special assessment role would be would be challenged in court according to the special benefit test. Under this test, if a property owner appeals their special assessment and if the court finds that the city has not added benefit greater or equal to that dollar amount of the special assessment, then the city must pay the difference plus legal fees and court costs. Incidentally, we did try to pave this same street a year ago, but because all of the costs came in above projection and higher than anyone was comfortable with, that it was unable to go forward at this time. So this is the second time that we've come at this. We looked at our assessment policy and the cost distribution again, and some of us concluded that indeed there should have been an end benefit onto Laurel Drive of a lower dollar amount, perhaps. Under this calculation and with comparative, the competitive bids that we received on the project, the end benefit onto Laurel would have been closer to 4,000 per family. This would be calculated by distributing the cost of the first 162 feet of Brandon Boulevard that lies within and adjacent to and interconnects with Laurel and having it paid as an end benefit to the Laurel families. We've come up with a compromise plan because the, the timeline of going back to recreate that, that new assessment role would not match up with this year's construction season. We've come up with a compromise plan that would still remove that westerly 162 feet of Brandon Boulevard paving to the eight affected property owners on Laurel. Some of that cost would go to the developer and a portion of it would go to the city. According to the actual bid, allowing for some contingencies, the cost of this 162 feet is $39,313.83. We've asked that each of the owners of the eight lots on Laurel voluntarily contribute 
$1,500 to this paving project. That totals 12,000 if all agree to do that. We currently have solid verbal commitments from seven of the eight families and we're waiting to hear from the one. Of course, we'll have some paperwork to sign to make it all official. The developer has agreed to pay $5,000 in addition to the $3,000 assessment on the two lots that he still owns on Laurel Drive. If all the residents of Laurel agree to pay, the amount that the city then would be responsible for, the top, top number is 22,313. It could be closer to 20,000 if the contingency funds were not needed. The total cost of this paving project as bid is $355,704. I'm requesting therefore, and as has been moved and seconded, that we commit up to 25,000 to the completion of this project. The most logical source of these funds is the state aid maintenance fund, which are state dollars set aside for transportation expenditures. We have approval from the state that this would be an acceptable use of these funds. By the way, if it would be 25,000, that totals about 7% of the total project cost. I don't anticipate having to go through this process again in future developments. <coughs> Partly because, through the hard work of this council, Nancy Ellis, we've revised our development policy, development agreement, to install infrastructure and show costs to buyers before the lots are sold. We also have now a slightly more clear approach to handling and benefits on existing streets. Glad to take any questions. Love to hear the discussion. Thank you. Mr. Grassley. I have, I have no questions. I just have a st uh, statement. Um, I've gotten more phone calls on this issue than the last big issue we've had in East Grand Forks. There are more people upset about the fact that we're going to take money somewhere else and put it on this project. Um, they're calling it a bailout of, of this project. Um, and when I say more than it's been more than 10 phone calls, legit phone calls. Um, some haven't been very pleasant. Um, and then in, on the other hand, those people that are living in that area deserve to get this project done. It's probably the best price we're going to get. So um, with that, I'm just letting people know that I did listen I'm willing to stick my neck out and it'll probably get chopped at some point in time but um, we just need to get this thing done um, but if we don't get all eight this isn't going to be a yes vote so I'm just letting you know anybody else have any comments or questions Mr. Dewars. thank you um, I haven't figured out exactly what I'm going to say yet, but uh, so I might get long chat. <laughs> um, I would like to start by going back to the first year I got onto the council, which was the year of 2008. Um, one of the biggest, <clears throat> the first big things that we got to do that year was create a budget. Um, and I don't know if you want to go back just a little bit before that, but the city had been Speaking of LGA, we had kind of take, taken some lumps from the state government at that time. Um, just prior to that, um, pretty much zeroing out our maintenance budget. Um, over the course of 2008 for the 2009 budget and 2009 for the 2010 budget, we rebuilt and improved upon the maintenance budget. <clears throat> the maintenance budget that we that we um, put forth uh, to the to the city's citizens of East Grand Forks that called for a tax increase. Um, and although um, our former mayor used to always tell us that it, the easiest thing to do is to raise taxes, um, I, I I disagree that it was tough. Um, it wasn't fun to do it. Um, but we knew at that time that we had a need for um, street maintenance, that we had let it go. Even in that short time, we had let street maintenance go for too long. So over the course of two years, we built that total fund up to about $350,000. I think it was two hundred fifty dollars from 
um, general fund and 100 plus or minus from state ma aid maintenance dollars. Um, the reason why I say that is because in response to the mayor at that time is it is difficult, but it's not undoable when you have integrity. It's something that we talked about when we did our our planning sessions. It was probably the number one start thing is what we want to put forward for the city of East Grand Forks is integrity. And when we put forth those raises, asked people to, to pay more taxes for their streets, for their street maintenance, if you go back and look at any of those budget documents, all they talk about is street maintenance. They don't talk about building new roads for other people. They don't talk about anything other than that. They talk about street maintenance. Um, so if we're going to have the integrity that we want to per portray and, uh, I guess, to, to model for, for the citizens of East Grand Forks, we need to be truthful to what our, our word was. Um, now, move forward to 2017. Say we have extra money in that fund. I guess my take is the proper action, it, I, first of all, I don't agree that we just have an excess of, I don't know, I don't see Jason, oh, Jason here. I would bet in the 10-year in the horizon, we're still probably short on maintenance dollars for our street uh, on the city side. Um, but even if we were, if we have so much money there, the proper the integrity, or the thing to do with integrity is not to spend it on other things. It's to, it's to give it back, because that's what, what we said. So when you say that it, this isn't a tax increase, this is a tax, this was a tax increase. This was increased in 2008, or 2009 to 2010. This was, we increased people's taxes for this. And while well, you can split the baby and say, well, 100,000 is coming from the state, and the state doesn't cover it. We, we tried that before. So that's why, so if you want to know why I have a bit of passion for some of these funds, you'll hear it sometimes when I talk about the Greenway Maintenance Fund. Because when we made those funds, we asked people to pay for them. And when, for us to go back on our word on what we said we were going to pay for and what we were going to do with that, that goes against my word. And I guess I understand the idea of trying to do it? Oh, I don't understand because I, because nowhere in this whole project should the city have been interjected. This wasn't the city's problem as far as paying for it. It was the city's problem to manage and negotiate. And to me, we are, we are going back on our word to the people that gave us that money for street maintenance to pay off. I guess to put it straight is we didn't. We don't want to be able. To, we don't want to have to tell people. The honest truth about what it costs to put a street in and that's that's what it comes down to and if if we're not going to do that I won't have any part of putting any of that money towards it um, the council can do what it wants but we better rethink what that top top thing is on the top of our list then if if that's the way we're going to do business so other than that proceed as as you like Again, you have someone else with a hand oh, up good. Okay. Okay. If we're talking about integrity, it, it was integrity that caused me to bring this effort in the first place. And the reason is this pavement absolutely benefits the folks on Laurel. And if we'd gone through with the council action along the timelines that we laid out, 100% of the cost would have gone to the families on Brandon who arguably have specials that are on the top end of anyone in our community already for curb, gutter, sewer, water. And now, if, if the specials absolutely fell in like that and should be at that level, even with this paving project, I say let the chips fall where they may. But our initial action, which did not put any end benefit onto Laurel, was in error, because they do benefit. In fact, one of the driveways from a family on Laurel actually delivers right onto Brandon. It's, it's indisputable, there's a benefit to Laurel. And if we had gone forward with our initial action, my, my own integrity would have been violated and, and it, it, it just wouldn't have happened. Okay, because we'd have been overloading the new development way beyond what it should have been. Okay, so you talk about integrity, this would violate my sense of right and wrong, my sense of justice to go forward with the original plan as we had it. 
Clarence, I know you're not, can't see you, so do you have any comments, sir? Yeah, I've got a few. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm glad that the mayor pointed out the history of this project, and I'd like to touch on that. When Laurel Drive was paid, Laurel picked up the entire cost of that project. So let's just say Laurel paid X then for their street. Had we done Laurel and Brandon Drive together as one project, Laurel would have paid front benefits on Laurel, they would have paid end benefits on Brandon. So they would have had X minus Y for their end benefits on Brandon. Brandon would have had the same thing. They would have had X for their front costs and Y that they would have subtracting out for the end benefits for Brandon, which Laurel would have been picking up, but they would have got end benefits from Laurel. In my mind, the cost would have been the same had we done all these projects the same. Laurel would have paid what they paid back when they paid their streets. Brandon would be paying what they're being proposed for special assessments now. There would have been no difference in cost, in my mind, because of the way our policy is written. So therefore, I can't vote for this. The second reason I can't vote for this is the same thing as Mr. Kraft. I've been getting a lot of calls and emails asking, when am I going to fix their streets now at the, at the city's cost? Because we're doing it now for Brandon Boulevard and those folks down there. So when are you going to do my street sell at our cost? So I can't do that either. We need to follow our policy, and the policy states that new construction will be picked up 100% by the new development. It's when we try to deviate from that policy that we get into problems, and therefore I won't be voting for this. Question for Mr. Emery. Um, the way I understand end benefits are calculated, would Laurel have received, or excuse me, would Brandon have received end benefit cost coming off of Laurel? Because it's all, it's just that side yard stuff, right? The way I understand how we apply our end benefit policy, had they all been done in one project, Brandon wouldn't have had to pay any end benefit off of Laurel because that's all front assessed. Brandon still may have, may have got some assessment off or an end off a of Laurel Drive. Even though it's all front assessed, there's no, there's no side yard at all in question there. Yeah, you would have still, on, on Brandon Boulevard, I think you would have still went halfway back between Laurel and Reinhardt Drive. And Laurel would have came halfway back onto Brandon, so the cost would have been a wash. But it's only for that part that lines up on the side. You know, the same way you calculate it on the cul-de-sac? Yep. You only, you only take out the side yard portion. Right. No front end portion at all. And I, I think I said this before. I've talked to our last three city engineers, and each has said, your policy is, when you come into an existing street with a new street, then you go back on the existing street and you, and you assess an end benefit. That's been our policy for decades, right up to this moment. That may have been the way they've applied the policy, but not the way you read our policy. Okay, well that's, that's been talking to our engineers who calculate all of our assessment roles. That's our policy. Yeah, because even <clears throat> if that 162 feet would have been paved, with Laurel Drive, you would have had the end benefit going north and south. On to Laurel. On to Laurel. You know, being that wasn't done, you know, that's that's what's caused the, the heartache, the extra burden for those people along Brandon Boulevard. And again, that's why at this point we're trying to figure out how to cover that cost of the 162 feet. Anything else, sir? Um, I would say the same to what you all have pointed out. Uh, and I know Mr. Pukshavinsky has said also that we're going to end up with a solution that nobody feels 100% thrilled about. Um, I don't like the idea of applying these state aid maintenance dollars to this, but I honestly can't find another way that we capitalize on the super bid that we got to do this project this year and still do right by the families 
on Brandon and Nate and Crystal. I can't find another way to do right by them, utilize the good bid that we got constructed in this season for the life of me. I can't think of another way to do it. This is totally about being favorable and fair to those families. If anyone wants to think of it as a sort of bailout to the development, it's sure not that. This is about fairness to the families living on Brandon, Nate, and Crystal, the best that we can, can put it together from, from this moment. And everybody has skin in the game. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. I guess I'd like to just follow up on a comment um, regarding what the mayor said about his integrity. And I, I didn't mean to call into question that you don't have integrity, but um, I wanted to outline, I guess, my rationale and what I think the city's rationale sh should be with, with a history perspective. Um, but on that, I think you're kind of missing the point in the fact that it seems like there's, there's an argument over what side the 162 should flip, and somehow in that negotiation, in that tennis match, someone else completely, we've added a whole other party that has no business being in it. So however you di divided it up, whether it was 60, 40, 100, 0, whatever, that would have been immeasurably more fair than what's going on right now. You, you keep saying that because of the timeline, we couldn't go back and talk to the people on Laurel, but we did. You're doing it. You're doing exactly what I told you guys to do and how we could do it. We, I said... Here's what we do. We say we go to them and we we give them, hey, this is going to cost you five thousand dollars. They might not have taken it, but then the alternative is the project doesn't get either the project doesn't get done, or you come back with another set of ratio, or the people on Brandon pay for it all. But in no by no means was this ever the person on Fifth Avenue Northwest's problem. It it isn't and I just that's that's my my whole hang up with this is if we want to if we want to figure it either of those ways I don't I'm all for it I, I could make an argument for either of those two people paying for it and I think Clarence laid out one way and I think you've laid out and I kind of tend towards believing that the folks on Laurel should have some skin on the game but <laughs> I'll, I'll say it a, a hundred times if I have to that there's no reason why everybody else in the town has to pay for this area. There's one more rationale that, that argues in favor of my proposal, and that is it puts us, the city, on very solid ground regarding the special benefit test. Okay, Special benefit test, which you heard earlier what that's all about, and you all know what that's about. Um, we want to be in a position where if ever called into question, we don't have exposure. Well, this is, this is the cheapest you're going to get paving in town for a long time. It is. So if, if that's your policy, then the policy is we're going to subsidize every new development paving because otherwise we're not going to pass the, the, the uh, Well, this raw dollar is, is still high based on length of feet and everything else. No, it's not. If, if you look at what the ratio was over at Riverview, they had 31 lots over there, and their, their specials are half. So we, that's, that's three times as many lots and half as much as what they're paying per, per When place. we launched out the way we did with the action that we took, count them nine. Nine that, appeals. Then we, then we heard it here in this council chamber. We're not going to do it then. Correct. If, if, the, if the test is they don't want it, then they don't want it. They want but if it. they don't want it because they're not paying or if they're not willing to pay full price for it, well, then that's too bad. We're not... It's not the city's responsibility to make it a sale for them. This creates fairness for Brandon, Nate, and Crystal. But this not for the rest of the city. It's the right thing to do. Anything else, Mr. Demers? No. Hey, you talk about history. I went back and looked at the beginning of this. I even went back farther. I went back to 2010 when Laurel Drive was done. Since 2010, they had a public hearing on this, and Laurel Drive was done. 
I had to do a petition to, to get it paved. And I went through a process of everybody fighting. And it required 35% of signatures. I got 39% of them completed. And people on there said they, some people can't pay the assessments. You know, I can read it. I have a copy of the public hearing right here. I mean, it seems to me that these new developments, some of these new developments that we deal with, we have issues. And continue to have issues. And tell me why. We have developers that come in and Mr. Demers indicated one of them that they paved it. I don't think we had an issue other than I think sidewalks. We had some issues on sidewalks, driveways. Correct? So, you know, go back and forth. I um I agree with Mr. Demers on on comments of and I've touted it, and I've said it. You're creating a street improvement district, which we can't. But it's and not that. Yes, it is. <laughs> and so, but we need to get this done. We need to move on. We need to make sure that the people that are begging to have this thing done, they get done so they don't have to worry about this winter coming up, the dirt, the mud, and everything else. And deteriorating everything down there, then we'll have a bigger problem. And we'll make sure we get the gravel back and the dirt back that Mr. Clarence wants to use. <laughs> so, anybody else have any comments? Not on the call. Mr. Bochavinsky. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Clarence, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I flunked algebra. <laughs> My Crookston math doesn't uh, doesn't quite compute. The, the numbers that, that you threw out, but um, having said that, this is my ward. And, um, and I've worked very hard with the mayor to get us to this point. And as he said, uh, there's parts of this that everybody dislikes. Um, if we don't do this, let me back up. If we do this, it's going to cost the city up to $25,000. If we don't do it, go another season, could cost the city $100,000 to $150,000. So any compromise um, forces people to swallow hard and make a tough, tough decision. I'm going to vote yes for this, and um, mm. I would ask everyone to respect everybody's vote on this, and when we get it behind us, that we move on to the next item. And I, that's all I have to say. Okay. Well, Ms. Henry. I'd just like to make one comment. As I recall it, we worked out a deal with Huntsville Township and we put some extra money in a number of years ago. It's a, it's a question a lot of times. Uh, we've got to make things work. Uh, they, uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of cities that are paying money to people to build homes. And uh, uh, it's, we don't have to do that. Our, 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 we are a growth community. And uh, sometimes you have to make things work. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't live anywhere near there, but I do know one thing, and that is we're bringing in a little over 29 acres. And uh, it's a major project, and uh, they, there's been a lot of spade work done on it. We'll probably have 50 new homes there, and uh, they'll be nice new homes, families, children, and so forth. Uh, I think you've got to be rational a little bit when you go into a community, what's happening. If it's growing, uh, is, isn't that the type of a community you want to have where uh, you've got uh, quality, in everything that's happened uh, in the future. 
we're finding out a number of things relative to growth. Uh, we're finding out that uh, there are a lot of people who like to live here. It's a good place to uh, have families, raise families, and it helps everybody. I do know of one instance. There is a firm that's looking over East Grand Forks. They will make substantial investment. It's a QT deal. Uh, I uh, don't have any hesitancy at all. I'm going to vote for it. But uh, uh, there are a lot of things that uh, we don't favor 100%. But uh, I think we should go forward with it. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll take roll call, please. Grassle. Yes. Demers? No. Better? No. Pakshavinsky? Yes. Riappel? Yes. Wheaton? Yes. Olson? No. Motion is carried. Entertain a motion to adjourn a special meeting. Move. Move second. by Pakshavinsky, second by Riappel. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. Special meeting is now adjourned. Good for you. Clarence. See you, Clarence. Taylor. Call to order the City Council work session for City of East Grand Forks, Tuesday, July 25th, 2017, is now 531. Call roll, please. Mayor C. Gander? Here. Council President Mark Olsted? Here. Council Vice President Chad Rossell? Here. Council Members Clarence Better? Mike Benjamin? Here. 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 Present. Does determine quorum. Read before you start. Actually, we're going to skip over you quick. Okay. Marty is here from the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, you want to come up and uh, address? I know you got to be somewhere else after this. So. Thank you, Mr. President. Here, I'm going to uh, council members and I hand out a uh, packet for each of you. And um, is it okay if I'm seated? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. My name is Marty Seifert. I am a uh, member of the government relations team at Flaherty and Hood. Uh, I live in Marshall, Minnesota, but uh, operate out of St. Paul a good chunk of the year, as well as visit my friends here in western Minnesota where I live. And I'm here as part of uh, your membership in the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities to report to you on what happened at the legislative session uh, as all of you know, uh, we take our marching orders from the Board of Directors at the Coalition. Um, the lobbyists don't tell you what to do, you tell us what to do. You set the agenda and we try to do our best to uh, get that implemented. Um, the packet that I handed out gives a uh, synopsis of what happened at the session, but I'm going to probably talk from this chart more than anything that's tucked inside of your packet. And it, it looks like a, a rectangular chart. It says legislative session outcome of CGMC priorities. Uh, as most of you know, local government aid has always been a, a high priority for the coalition members. Um, East Grand Forks is in a very unique situation on the formula. Unique almost to, of our 90 members, I think the most unique. Um, there is a flow chart that accompanies the inside of your packet that talks about um, the impacts on LGA proposals for East Grand Forks. It is probably one of the few cities in the state of Minnesota where regardless of how much money you put into the formula under whose proposal, the governor, the legislature, the Democrats, the Republicans, us, you, or anybody, um, the results are the same. And it's that East Grand Forks is getting a decline in the amount of local government aid that it's getting. And that's because the formula operation under the 2013 reform um, takes into account your property tax wealth. And since 2011, um, you have had a 31% increase in your tax base. You know, most people at the Capitol would love to have that in their communities because, frankly, I go to most of my rural cities and, and they're like, what do we do to grow? What do we do to develop? Um, woe is me. Um, East Grand Forks is in a very unique situation. You are in the top 30% per capita tax base of all cities of Minnesota. That includes the Metro, Minneapolis, Rochester. So you are above the top third 
in per capita tax base wealth. Um, average rural city had 15% growth in their tax base. You had 31% growth since 2011. Um, we do have one factor in the formula that was inserted um, some years ago. One of the factors is how much pre-1940 housing do you have, and that was changed with the flooding and other factors just for East Grand Forks to be 1990. And in the 2013 reform, they considered ditching that. They threw out pretty much all the specials. Um, we made sure East Grand Forks stayed in with their special. Um, that SPIF, um, roughly, the analysis I got back from house research was you get about $80,000 from the SPIF on the formula versus if they ditched it, you'd be down another 80 from where you are at. Um, so I guess the question on local government aid is when the formula works and you are growing as a city and your wealth is growing, your property tax base is growing, your LG allocation goes down. And um, you know we probably have a couple other cities in your situation, but not a lot, and we'd like to know what you think about that because this is a little it's it's a little dicey because there's a lot of cities would love to be in your situation they don't want to lose their local government aid on the flip side you know you're you're seeing yourselves kind of wean off of the formula um and uh you know i talked to my bosses this afternoon i said you know east grand is in a really interesting position compared to most of our other members that i go visit like thief river falls and crookston and so forth so um, if you have any input on that, I'd like to hear any feedback that your members may have for us to take back. Because, I mean, we can do tweaks to the formula. Um, we did for Fairmont last year. It wasn't an East Grand Forks type issue. It was they were an anomaly on the formula and they were losing a hundred grand a year. Because of that anomaly, it wasn't because of growth in their tax base. Um, and we were able to get that passed. because of, And they were members. They didn't pay extra. They just said, you know, this is something that, that we want you to do. So... That, that's kind of the first issue I'd like to just, if you have any discussion, just leave it alone. Um, do you guys want to talk about it between now and when the legislature convenes in February and give us an idea? We're, we're open to whatever you think, but we'd like to kind of get at least an impression of what, you're, what you guys think of this. Does anybody have any questions or comments, Mayor? You know, um, we know there's a, a disparity in average home price in the several major cities kind of in northwestern Minnesota between Thief River, Crookston and here for the same home it would be much higher here and we don't know why that is of course that's what feeds into this formula is is that very number um, is it our proximity to Grand Forks and, and, and it's kind of a magnet for people wanting to live here or is it still kind of a remnant of the flood of 97 where we lost so many of these great starter homes uh, and so our, our, our inventory of homes got skewed to the higher end, and there we are. Um, I don't think any of us really knows where it comes from. Um, it's a little troubling, both from the LGA standpoint and also from a standpoint of young families. You know, think of, you know, you're newly married, you have a child on the way, you want to buy your first home, and, and it's, it creates a bit of a challenge. So it is something we are, we're looking at all the time. Uh, Mr. Gordy in economic development works on affordable housing and, and you know, we're all racking our brains. Um, but I think it's probably both of those factors. Part of it does go back to the flood and the fact that we lost all that inventory of those great starter homes. And part of it is uh, pro probably our proximity to Grand Forks um, adds to the, the appeal of living here. How that affects you and your calculation. Of course, if you can find a way to to maintain and, and grow that LGA, that would be very helpful. Anybody else have a question? <laughs> I already <heard you. laughs> I know. I we had a sidebar earlier, yeah, but. Just wanted to make sure. If you want to share with the rest of the group, perhaps. I can put it on the record, I guess. Um, yeah, I, we had a chance to kind of sidebar before the, the meeting. and. You know, like Henry said, East Grand Forks is a growing place to be. Um, and I think this, this information really bears that out. Um, like Marty said, um, it kind of puts us in a tough spot. But it's, of all the tough spots, I think this is one of the most enviable. Um, 
I guess my own perspective is I believe in LGA. I believe in the, L the idea of it. I believe in the purpose of it. Um, and I believe that for us to make sure that the, that word again, that the integrity of LGA remains intact, we have to be um, honest with not only where we're at and the benefits we've received and how, what our relationship is to other communities um, throughout greater Minnesota, um, and not to overplay our hand. I think, you know, obviously I think, I believe that the, the program in general can go up and we should, if, if it all goes up, you know, maybe we, we start to um, you get some, you know, cost of living or some inflationary adjustments and all that, but, um, but I would hate to see us seem greedy <laughs> um, and, and just go after more just because we, we're going to sick Marty on them. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a lot for a lot of legislators to handle. So, um, but I just, not that I don't think that, you know, we should work to maximize our revenues and all those type of things, but um, I just, in order to make sure that LGA is around for the long term, I just don't think we should push super hard. Um, and uh, I don't know what exactly that means, but um, <laughs> make it as muddy for you as possible. But I'd, I, we can all weigh in and maybe you have a resolution or when we go um, talk to the board and stuff this fall, I guess we can, we can address it further. But I just think, you know, we're, we are in a good spot. Um, we are losing some revenue from that, but the cause of it is a good thing. It's, it's not a governor taking it away from us. It's, it's us. So um, the more, you know, I think we've talked a little bit in the past of how maybe we need to come up with a strategy, our own weaning strategy to, to make our budget more stable um, and, and look to the next 10, 15 years, 20 years, and see how you, you reduce that number or if it's going to reduce even further, how how we make sure that we we, we gird ourselves for that. So I, I don't want to, this is it shouldn't be a uh, you know waving the white flag of this, but it's just if you see what the trend line is, um, and and also you know like I talked to Marty, we've got a lot of like you said we've got a lot of folks in our region that um, don't have the the situation we have. You know everybody's got their own problems, but you know we can be honest and say that, you know, when a dollar gets spent or uh, allocated to Crookston, there's a good portion of that money that's probably going to end up in the greater Grand Forks metro, metro market. It just is. That's the way it works. And every dollar over here kind of ends up back down in St. Paul. So it's, it's good for our region to have those guys have more money and, and stuff as well. So I'm, I'm done. Question I have you from Marty on this is, you know, in the last couple of years there's been a lot of talk of people wanting to get rid of some of the bigger cities in LGA. Have you guys heard much with that again, or is that kind of went away? Because the, the fear was if, let's say, Duluth sit in Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, if that went away, that the whole thing would go away, you know, and it would be like a, you know, not a good way to, to do it. Have you guys heard much talk with that this year, if that's going to come back? It was very little this year. Last year, it's all we heard. This year, I think they got swatted pretty hard. Um, you know, and, I, and this is probably overly dramatic, but I, I liken it to before World War II. You know, I mean, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth do not belong to the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, but if one of them is attacked, they are cities in the state of Minnesota, and we stick up for our other cities. That's kind of what our board of directors has told us, is we're not going to allow them because they're going to start plucking Rochester, which is a coalition member. Oh, maybe East Grand Forks has too much tax base now. And then pretty soon the whole sweater falls apart because all of a sudden everybody's, you know, they start picking on this person in that city. And then there's a few left and there aren't enough legislators in rural Minnesota to stand up for them. So lots of talk about that last year. Uh, very little talk of that this year, and I think we convinced them that, I mean, St. Paul came and gave a pretty good presentation in the tax committee on the number of people that come into St. Paul who do not pay property taxes but use their services. They go to a concert at the Excel Center. They got police standing all over the place. Um, they have to pay for that police, 
but three-fourths of the people in the stadium don't live in the city of St. Paul. Excel hockey games, blah, blah. Now, you can make the argument the sales tax is helping that they get, but, you know, all these tax-exempt buildings like the Capitol, the state office building, the Judicial Center, they've got more colleges than any other city in the state. None of them pay taxes on property, but they have, they have a fire, they have a police call, they have to pay to send people there. So there's some good arguments on both sides of this issue, but I've heard precious little this year, and I think we're kind of moving past it, but you'll see it spark up here and there. Um, and when I was in the legislature, you know, I, I looked at some of the things some cities did and didn't agree with them, but at the end of the day, if you're gonna have an, the integrity of the LGA program, you have to look past some individual circumstances. You know, we have over 800 cities in the state, and some are gonna do things we maybe don't agree with, but at the end of the day, they can get voted out. You know, that's the way it works. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mike? Just one comment on something Mr. Demers said about money that ends up in Crooks and some of it comes here through commerce. Um, highway 2 is a four-lane highway, but it's a two-way street. And on, on Friday afternoon or even Thursday at the end of the day, a lot of cars go from Grand Forks and East Grand Forks through Crookston. Some of them stop at gas stations, Walmart, other stores in Crookston. So money flows both directions. And, and if you grew up in Crookston, as Mr. Riapel and I have, um, you, you get that perspective, and, and it's... You know, we're, this guy works over there a couple days a week. So he's driven that road a few times too. So money flows both directions. And, um, and so our friends in Crookston, uh, if they're listening, <laughs> we appreciate the money that flows this way. And I hope you appreciate the money that flows the other direction. Anybody else have any questions or comments on the LGA? If not, we'll... Okay, I'll move through the other items rather quickly. I wanted to focus on that LGA a little bit because you are in a unique circumstance. Um, the other item in the tax bill, um, we had, well, specific to you, we have the Border Cities program, um, and Representative Keel and um, Senator Johnson and others worked on that. We were able to get some money on that. Um, also, on the business side, there's a coalition that works on city issues, but we also obviously look out for some of our small business people in rural Minnesota. If you look at this chart, the tax bill contained, um, so it says CGMC City Report East Grand Forks at the top. I kind of customized it for you. On the bottom part, there is a $100,000 exemption for CI tax portion of your property tax. It'll be picked up by the state of Minnesota now. Um, the Metro people weren't real big on this because, as you can imagine, if you have a strip mall, the Mall of America, et cetera, exempting hundred grand out of that is you know, a rounding error. But if you go down the main street of here, Crookston, you know, the different towns around here, that, that's a pretty big chunk of their CI tax getting exempt. In some cases, these really small towns, it's going to wipe out the entire CI portion of their entire main street. And um, you know, it's like a $700 tax cut for those small business owners. So we, we did support that. It was an understanding platform that the exec board came up with, and we worked on that as well. Uh, real quickly, on the rest of that uh, rectangular chart, workforce housing, um, there was no money put into the tax credit that we proposed. Um, they just kind of ran out of money in the tax bill. Uh, TIF authorization, you know, I'm a little skeptical of using TIF for some of these things, but it's going to be an authorization. You guys figured out your local officials. And then there was some modest amount of money put into some workforce housing grants um, that's being used by um, our rural communities. The next one, the Clean Water Infrastructure Grant Program, that was chiefly in the bonding bill. We lobbied for $167 million. It ended up at $116. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, we're not going to get 100% of everything we want. Um, and I don't consider the fact that we get two-thirds or one-third or one-half or 80% of what we ask for a failure. A at the end of the day, you guys are on the city council. Not everybody gets everything they want. That's just the way life is. And so um, I thought $116 million for, for um, sewer and water projects, chiefly almost all of them in rural Minnesota, was a pretty good win for us. I mean, keep in mind, we had no bonding bill last year. We had no tax bill for two years in a row. This session was actually, I thought, okay. Um, pretty low bar compared to the last two. 
Um, <laughs> environmental reform, we had a variety of uh, reforms that we proposed on the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. There is going to be a listening session or whatever they want to call it. The governor is going to have, I think, in Crookston coming up. And if any of you can go um, and let them know that these unfunded mandates from the MPCA are not appreciated. We have a lot of rural cities that are going to be under duress with um, chloride standards, phosphorus standards. I mean, they're talking about nitrogen now and this, that, and the other. And... Um, it's going to get expensive because at the end of the day, it's either the property taxpayer, the utility payer, the end user somewhere we have to pay the bill. Um, the independent peer review that we wanted, now they, they do have a directive now on trying to do peer review. We're, gonna, we're skeptical, but hopefully it'll be a, a step in the right direction. Um, and we also proposed that they couldn't impose requirements that hadn't gone through rulemaking, and they were absolutely opposed to that. So they opposed everything we wanted to do. Um, the only thing we got passed in the environmental reform was allowing cities more time to analyze and comment on their permits and on the impaired waters unless they get an extra 30 days. Um, otherwise, the PCA was a, opposed to everything for reform that we wanted to do. It was very disappointing. Uh, BDPI, I think you guys have used BDPI in the past. That's a, a public infrastructure program. So if you have a newer expanded business, they need a, a public, not private bailout, but a public connection for sewer water um, service road, whatever, you can use BDPI. That was funded chiefly out of the bonding bill at $12 million. On the other side is the transportation um, plan. Um, you know, our big focus was on city street aid, particularly for the cities under 5,000 because they get zero right now. Um, at least cities of your size and larger get 9% of the gas tax. And so we have cities in my area that are 4,900, and there's no it's a cliff. There's no feathering down. So if you're Wyndham, Pipestone, and Laverne, and you're at 4,800 people, you get zero. So if someone fills up their gas tank in you know, Laverne or Wyndham, um, none of that gas tax dollar goes back for their city streets, where if you are you know, East Grand or Hutchinson or Marshall, you get 9% of it back. And so we're, you know, our coalition is made up of a diverse group. And the bigger cities like yours have all been okay with trying to do something on city streets. We're not for a constitutional amendment because that's too messy, but to try to find a funding source. So we ended up getting $8 million a year for two years. We are going to go back and ask that the program be made permanent and that they try to double or triple the size. Um, corridors of commerce are your major roads that connect thoroughfares, like Highway 2. Um, $200 million is what we were hoping for. They did $300 million in one-time trunk highway bonding. So they actually did more money, but on a one-time basis. But if you're going to do one-time spending, it makes sense to do it in the transportation area because you can bid it out, you can get it out there, get the project done, passing lanes, whatever. Um, it's not smart to do that in you know, programmatic areas. You don't hire a person and then lay them off the next year. Um, the biggest part that was a success there was $25 million a year forever in cash for quarters of commerce because there are certain things like design engineering right away that you cannot use bonding dollars for. The bond councils won't allow it. So this, the $25 million a year in cash is a big deal. That was one of our high priorities. Um, we also changed um, a factor in quarters of commerce to try to ensure that there's rural fairness. It tends to be a 50-50 program, 50 rural, uh, 50 metro. And we put another factor in there to try to make sure that they stick with the program on that. All right, I tried to pound about 50 pounds of potatoes in a 10-pound bag. Um, what kind of questions? We do have our conference coming up. I, I don't know if you're sending. Are you guys sending anyone to the conference here in a week or two? Um, in Fergus Falls, there's still some opening if anybody wants to come. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your leadership and your involvement in the coalition for so many years. Um, a group of us was down to your gathering in January, right? And we do appreciate the, the framework that you give us. I mean, if we came in to, to try to mesh with, you know, some of the elected officials down in St. Paul, it might be more difficult. But the fact that we can connect with your group kind of get some updates on, on current legislation that's before them and, and kind of get some good marching orders, plus do our own thing that, that we were inclined to do. So thank you for your assistance in us um, connecting with those folks, making these decisions. Um, I feel like we had some good contact, both in our tax bill, which came through for the swimming pool, the bonding bill for our interconnect. Um, 
because of that meeting, I feel we made some great contacts that can help push that a little bit along. So thank you to your group for facilitating that. Yeah, we, we do appreciate that. And uh, the bonding chair is a very good friend of mine, and we uh, always try to make sure we have good disbursement of the bonding dollars and, and make it you know where it's fair. It's a tough job because you got to tell three people no for everyone you say yes to. And so it's, it's a tough job, but uh, at the end of the day, I think those connections are important. And we tell them, the reason you see us all the time is you guys can't be there, for goodness sakes, how, how many hours is to drive back and forth. There's a reason we're there, <coughs> you know, trying to inform the legislators on what's going on, because it's just, I mean, it's impossible for someone from here, Rosa or Waro, to be down there all the time. It's, it's probably not good use of their money to be back and forth, back and forth. Um, Thief River was there quite a bit because they had the DigiKey issue. Um, so we saw them a, we saw them a lot this <laughs> year. Any other questions for me? Otherwise, I'm heading over to Warren for their city council meeting at 7. Anybody else have anything? I appreciate you coming, Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Reed, if you want to step up, we'll do the police officer's motorcycle on Greenway request, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so last Greenway meeting, or I'm sorry, the last work session, Mike Anderson, retired sergeant with the police department, was here to, to talk about a request he was going to bring forward to name a section of the Greenway Trail in memory of Officer Kenneth Olson, who was killed in the line of duty in the late 70s. Um, we asked at that point that he come and visit with the Greenway Committee last week on Tuesday to get a few more of the details, hopefully worked out there, and follow some of the, for the naming portion of of the request, some of the criteria the Greenway Committee has in place to make sure it's a, it fits and that we could hopefully work out some of those details. Um, I handed out a packet very late here, just, just right at the start of the meeting for everybody. So it's new information for all of you. I apologize for that, but it's kind of been coming in hot. Uh, I talked with Mr. Anderson today, and I think, Mr. Pokshavinsky, you might be able to add a little bit more detail, but we found in the request that he brought forward, it'd be probably most prudent of us to look at it from, as two separate requests. One request to name the trail and a second request to ride, have the annual motorcycle ride go on the Greenway Trail. Um, the first request of naming the trail, there are still some details that we would like to work out as far as the portion of the trail uh, and then, of course, some of the style guidelines of making sure that whatever type of signage they would request be on it and some of the terminology that would be on the signage, that it would be done to fit the style guidelines of the Greenway that were, were adopted with the, the creation of the Greenway. Uh, I'd, in visiting with Mr. Anderson today, he was aware of those guidelines and is willing to, you know, to get together with us as we go forward on that. The size or the, the area that he's requesting the trail to be named, I think, is still probably the biggest thing in question from a naming standpoint. His request was from the North Pedestrian Bridge, and there's a map in your packet, all the way, the whole trail, all the way to the Louis Murray Bridge, following through the recreation area to the campground. Um, I have a couple of concerns with that. One, the concern being that it goes through the state, the DNR property. Uh, so if we want to name that, the DNR has indicated that they'd be willing to work on that, but again, there would be some processes that we would need to go through with them in order to get that approved through the DNR. I don't know yet what those processes are. Um, and two, the only other concern would be that it, that is a significant portion of the Greenway Trail, and um, the Greenway Committee didn't make any recommendation, recommendation one way or another on, you know, the significance of this memorial and how that fits its in its merit as far as the significance of that size of trail. Just thinking off the top of my head as I was preparing some of this packet, a, a, a couple of examples you can think of is we have the South Pedestrian Bridge is, gra is the Grand Forks Bridge, but that's named after Pat Owens. It's a bridge. Um, we just recently, when Mayor Stelz was still here, named the Joan Croc Parkway. Um, for a, a small section of that street. So in those two terms, those are smaller portions of land than what this is. 
So thinking through that, if we want to take the step of going through the process and that size of a significant size of a trail, we could certainly do that. Ultimately, it's up to the city council to approve or disapprove the naming of that trail. The suggestion that I would bring forward with that is maybe we look at so that it's a little bit easier and it just look at city property, what could be named. The first request that Mr. Anderson had was starting at the North Pedestrian Bridge and going to through River, River Road, River Heights area, um, because that portion would run through or very close to his widow's house and thought that that would be very significant to her and to the family that that was named after him. I think that if we went from the North Pedestrian Bridge to 17th Street, the River Road 17th Street kind of intersection, right before it hits the rec recreation area property, that, I mean, that, to me that sounds like an appropriate size of the trail. Uh, it'd be very easy to dedicate with signage on each side that people could ride by and see uh, and know the significance of it, a little bit more manageable from a signage standpoint even. When I say that to you, that's that's not something that I have shared in conversation with Mr. Anderson. So my thought process in that is to you guys first. Um, so that's kind of where the naming stands. The last thing that we would need to decide what to do on the naming is for their ride on August 12th coming up in just a couple of weeks. He wants to unveil a sign to, for the dedication of the trail as part of the ride. So even if we want to work out details, if it's allowable, Mr. Murphy, I'd want some, some support on that if it's allowable by vote. If we just say yes, we approve a sign at this location and then figure out the details of the, the trail naming as far as the space it covers after that, maybe we could go that way. The next part of it, if I can keep going, is the motorcycle ride part. That we found, again, he wanted to get on the trail right at that 17th Street River Road area and follow the trail through the recreation area, through Lefebvre Park to the Louis Marie Bridge on the Greenway Trail uh, with anywhere from 80 to 100 motorcycles by police escort. The first question that we had as, as a Greenway committee again was what type of hoops do we have to go through or process do we have to follow with the DNR and with their property? Um, in talking with Gary Haft, the regional manager of trails there, he suggested that it sounds like a very worthy cause and that they'd be willing to look at it, but did not feel that in three weeks that was enough time to come up with an agreement um, or to allow permission for that. The Greenway Committee had a couple other questions there, just in, more in light of precedent and is that a proper use of the trail when it's, it, it's a non-motorized trail. So that, again, would, would be up to um, approval by the DNR for the portion that goes through their property and then up to the city council. So I think if anyone else has any questions or things to add, I know, Mike, you're certainly going to have some information to add from your conversation with Mr. Anderson. But from the perspective that and the information that I can share with you, Mr. Heft with the DNR said that at this time they would not approve it. The agreement, the operations agreement we have with the DNR states that any special events that go through DNR property must be approved by the DNR by their division director. And at this point, he has not been notified or, or they have not had a conversation with the division director about allowing that, the use of the trail for that purpose. Anybody have any questions for Reed at this moment? One question I do have, <clears throat> what, you know, you indicated from the North Pedestrian Bridge the 17th there, um, would that, let's say that, you know, goes forth and gets approved, let's just say that it's dedicated, okay, mm -hmm. for the sake of the argument. What, what would be wrong with having that portion, instead of going through the DNR, the campgrounds, that portion be ridden in back onto River Road there at that, right after the flood wall, and call it that where everything, and they could go back onto the street? Mm -hmm. I mean, would that be something that would be, you know, worked out? As far as having the motorcycle ride? Right. I, I didn't have that conversation with Mr. Anderson yeah, about if that would be an ideal route. I, the, the biggest concern that I would have and that the Greenway Committee would have is the motorized vehicles on the trail. The, the risk in that and then, of course, just the, you know, the idea of the precedent that may be set with allowing a ride like that and for a very worthy cause to bring recognition to, you know, fallen officers, very, very worthy. But, um, you know, at that point, again, 
is it specific just to that event or does it open the door to many more requests and of motorized vehicles on the trail? I think that'd be the biggest concern that the Greenway Committee would look at is the safety for that. I guess if I could, you know, the one thing I would say is I, I like the approach that you're taking. You know, it's an affirmative approach that says we're going to find a way if there is a way to, to do this. I like the idea of it being a little bit smaller area that is more manageable, that we have more control over than, than trying to extend it out. Um, and of course, as we honor the fallen officer, Kenneth Olson, we're honoring all of our officers mm -hmm. and, and even extending to others who are you know, in harm's way for us in our, in our military. So it has a real nice feel to it. I like that you're partnering with them to try to make it happen and also working through the Greenway and through the DNR. Um, so if, if you ask me, you're on the right road, you know, to, to find the proper dimension of the dedication and then also asking the questions of, can we allow this to happen as for the ride? You know, maybe working with Mr. Galstead on, uh, without opening up the door to other motorized activity on the trail, which would really go counter to the whole purpose of the trail system. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Reed. Anybody else have any comments? Mike? Thank you. Um, I can't add any more detail to what Reed has already presented other than to say that um, I did speak with Megan, I've spoken with Catherine, um, and from what I understand, the, to get a permit approved by the DNR, we're running out of days, we're running out of calendar. And so in speaking with Mr. Anderson this morning, he said they aren't, um, they, they're fine with not being on the trails this year, maybe over the winter they can cut through the red tape and get a permit for possibly being on the trails if, uh, you know, it, it's about a 15 minute ride. The trails can handle the weight of motorcycles and it would be just like any other parade, but it would be on the Greenway Trail. So we, there's precedent for that, okay? And we did, I was at that Greenway meeting and we did have a good healthy back and forth about that. Um, what Mr. Anderson suggested today is if they if they can't get the permit for this year, they're fine with that. They'll do the unveiling of the signs up by the top of River Road there by 17th. Then they would they would ride their their bikes down 17th towards Highway 220, come south on 220, onto Demers, past Whitey's, turn right on the wet side of the imaginary flood wall, invisible flood wall, and, and then go down to the confluence of the two rivers or somewhere, somewhere in there. That's their route. They don't need a permit for that. They are, this is America. They can ride on the roads anywhere they want. They would give the police department a heads up so they know they're coming. They'd probably get an escort, which is a courtesy to the, the, city and the, it, all of its employees and um, and and that's kind of where I see this going this year and um, on a personal note I passed along um, on behalf of the city and the council and the police department and everything everything else um, asked Mike to to talk to the officer's widow and let her know that um, she's in our thoughts and prayers today, and this event on the 12th will be something that we'll remember um, for the sacrifice that his, her and her family made. So uh, with that, we'll see what happens. And that's, that's Mr. Anderson's up in Warroad for work today, so he couldn't be here. Uh, but he asked me to speak on his behalf, and I said I would. So, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I guess hearing, and I, I'm kind of just hearing what you're saying about what uh, what the group has said, and if they're not so um, bent on getting this the precise route set this year, I would rather take the time and do it right 
Um, I think there's a couple areas over there that would be good, um, and I think we should take the time to hash it out, knowing that we're going to do this um, and make it the best that we can. Um, and, and instead of trying to force it into somewhere that it might be this year and maybe not next year or whatever, I would suggest that route and get to the drawing table tomorrow and have it ready for next year. I guess. I'd be willing to work with you and Reed on that. Right, yeah. And, and I guess the other comment, too, was, you know, will this – present a, a precedent that we're going to start letting these and you know we've I've been involved when other people have asked to be on there with motor vehicles and uh, none of them have 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 had the sacrifice that that has been given um, in this case and I don't think there's any equivalence to it would be a, you'd be pretty hard pressed to, to show an equivalence to what we're allowing the on bar, this. The bars up here. Yeah, on yeah, and there's only one r way to reach it. So um, hopefully this is our only ride. Um, and But it, it will happen. And just because you aren't the ones that are on there, if your group or whatever, it's no slight against you, but you didn't meet the, the criteria, didn't even come close. So, um, but I think, I, I think it'll be a good thing. They've been doing it for a while. And if we can make this a little more formalized for them and, and stuff, and, and, and I think it'll be a good thing. So, Mark, just let me clarify something. Do you, are you talking the route and not the naming? You, you want to hold off and plan the, the route? And well, I mean, not the route, route but the, the trail. trail. Like, whichever section of trail we're going to do. If, it's, if there's a section, like you said, like from the North Bridge to 17th, right. that works except for how do you get on. Unless you come on from Grand Forks, yeah. right? I mean, well, up, so yeah, I mean, there's you go a, up 19th there, yep. right up there. So. There's an access right there. Right. It's a little crooked. But yeah. 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 yeah, I suppose. Yeah, you could go up there. My, so, my my question is: Are we are we talking the whole not naming going forth and naming them this year and the trail the pattern whatever you want route, or are we just saying the route on the trail, but we want to make sure that we move forward with the name? Well, I think you have to pick the route first, and then that's why I'm that's kinda, the I name. Make so, sure. or do we say that a we are going to name the trail after him, but we don't know the total route yet. We can still have an unveiling. I just want to make sure. Right. Yeah. I guess if we want to go through and formally dedicate, <laughs> I don't know if it's a portion of trail to be determined at a later if they understand that I'm fine with doing that too is I'd, I'd love to, sure. to see the trail dedication happen this year if you can identify it's going to the ride will include this segment it might go more this way it might go more that way and here's the segment of trail that we is close to the, the, the family's home and uh, I'd be happy to see the trail dedication earlier and then the, the ride route determined in the next year that's what I would love to see because they do want to do an unveiling now in, in August right of a sign right they have a sign already made that they hope to unveil this year in August. So I think that'd be if there's a way to do that that we can allow permission or approve permission to put a sign out, knowing that we're going to dedicate a portion of the trail, so they can have that unveiling, and then we can work out details of the exact section. So for the next Tuesday, have. do you want to come back with after you speak to them and say, okay, this is what we're, you know an sure. understanding? I guess I think they will all know make sure so we want to make sure that we, we do this yeah sure you know, like mark said we need to do it right and next tuesday i, I agree can, yeah the, I, now you, to clarify next tuesday do you want to know the section of the trail that will be that we're game? not going to know that because gnr okay. is not going to exactly in one time okay so at least some language to approve a sign sign correct yeah very good yes everybody's okay with that mm -hmm. thank you mark anything else on that Okay, just want to make sure. Number two, authorizing to prepare plans and specifications and report in feasibility 2018 assessment job number one, street and pedestrian improvements, Steve Emery. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, in March of this year, the City Council um, chose five project areas, options uh, to include as part of our 2018 project. We used the federal sub target dollars receives every four years. Um, furthermore, by resolution,
motion. Again, we approve the amending of the TIP for these project areas so the city can receive and utilize federal dollars for these project costs. Um, in summary, I did, uh, again, highlight the five project areas that um, we had chosen and the five project areas that are currently on the, the TIP. Again, we had the multi-use trail um, along Highway 220 from 20th Street Northwest to Highway 2, uh, the Greenway Boulevard reconstruction, and some sidewalk improvements along Greenway Boulevard, um, Biglin Road and 13th Street, um, have some pedestrian safety improvements we'd like to do there. Reinhardt Drive reconstruction um, from 6th Street north up to Biglin Road. And then off of the Minnesota or Point Bridge, we have a section of mill and overlay over there. Um, again, I gave you kind of an estimated construction cost um, along with the engineering administration legal costs. And the proposed funding on that one, again, right now the city is looking at receiving about 860,000 in federal uh, sub-target dollars. Again, about 30% assessment on Reinhardt Drive. Um, they do have, or there are some TRLF bond money that have not been expended that we could use. And then there's a balance of about 461,000. Um, again, if you remember two at the time, I think we initially chose four options and then kind of convinced you let's add one more option in case we do get good uh, bids. Again, trying to maximize um, our federal dollars because we have to have about $1.1 million in construction costs to get the full $860,000. So kind of depending on, too, what, where construction dollars come in, um, you know, we are going to have the option to uh, eliminate one of these options if, if the funding isn't there. And again, I think, you know, the one that we kind of chose after the fact was, was that multi-use trail along Highway 220. So um, again, it, once we get construction costs, the city can choose at that time um, what, what projects we want to move forward with. But um, so right now, I guess with Everything we went through earlier this spring with amending the TIP and everything, we just kind of realized we hadn't gone through the process to formally approve us to move ahead with plans and specs. And we'll also have to complete the report of feasibility um, for the Reinhardt Drive reconstruction project. Um, we will have to complete, file with council, and then move ahead with uh, an improvement hearing. Do so you have any questions from Mr. Emery on this? Mr. Demers. Thank you. Mr. President, um, is the plan to put these in one project or multiple projects? Or? Nope, this would be one project with essentially five proposals. Okay. Any other questions to Mr. Demers on that? Not right now, thank you. You have questions for Mr. Emery, Henry, <clears throat> on this project? The question I have, when we get all done with state aid, how much are we short? Well, right now, Carla had kind of laid out some, some information for you with what's in state aid maintenance right now. Again, right on these projects, being they are on our state aid system, we can use our municipal construction dollars. As of today, we have a balance of about almost $263,000 in yeah, construction that. dollars. Um, and again, that number, you know, if we receive about the same amount next year, we should be up close to 500000 in that that fund so so we should have enough dollars municipal construction dollars to pay for the city's portion of this project of all of them yep Carla. just want to keep in mind though that we, we haven't looked at 20th and 5th of those other projects that we will need to get from the state aid maintenance dollars to fund that. but we will look to see what we can get um, from the state aid construction for 
Well, the, the, uh, the only reason I ask that question is that uh, I have always been for street improvements, but uh, with what's happening to us in LGA, we're taking a pretty good boost, and, and uh, if we have to levy taxes for it, well, you're going to find uh, a lot of people aren't too happy for a tax increase. Uh, so that's something we want to remember. It, it's nice that we I support good streets. I always have, so. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Emery? Seeing none, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Number three, 2018 MnDOT transit applications were fixed for route in Dalaride. Ms. Ellis. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I apologize. Uh, apparently, my Fitbit and my Map My Run decided that it took me 37 minutes to walk down here. So I don't think my stats today are going to look very good with the 37 minute, 200 foot walk, but I digress. Um, this is an annual application that we have to go through with the state of Minnesota for our uh, Greater Minnesota Transit Funds. Um, I've been here a number of times this year. Uh, they had some additional funding for new service expansion, which we did receive 100% funding for, which would be to implement the new routes that we're looking at for 2018. Um, so that's funded at 100%. We have those funds, the contract in hand, and the bus. What we did do with our normal application was uh, worked with Cities Area Transit to do our cost allocation model for our typical route run that we do for uh, a year. Um, we're seeing small changes to the actual cost of the service. Uh, same amount of mileage right now because the implementation of the new routes wouldn't occur until at the earliest June. And then once those new routes uh, changes occur, we'll do a new cost allocation model with the exception that the East Grand Forks additional costs would be paid for at 100%. So this is just, again, um, the typical application that we have. Based on that, there's, uh, our fixed route is funded with federal aid dollars, which again, I'm still working on going more than a 50-50 split. Um, so you take your total cost for a fixed route minus your federal funding, minus any um, fares and revenue that you receive then with that amount, the state gives you 80% of that remaining amount and the city pays for the additional 20%. So that's kind of how the formula works. Um, typically that costs the city around 50 to 60,000 local share. Um, nothing has changed there. Dial a ride, uh, we estimate at about 60,000. We do not receive federal funding for that, but that's a 85-15 uh, uh, split. So it, it will cost us around uh, 9000 um, The one thing that I did do this year is because it seems like um, more than what I've been charging of my salary, it, it's hard to quantify how much of my time goes to each specific thing that I'm doing. So I went with a flat 20%. So the state, um, I put that in, and then the state would cover the 80-20% of 20% of my salary. So um, I did bump that up just because it seems like with the record keeping and the things that I have to do, it, it's taking up at least one day out of the week for me to, to work through transit. So with that, we're looking at about 60,000 local share. I included the uh, application. Um, we have a resolution that we'll need to pass. It doesn't list uh, prices it lists the percentages because we don't receive our award until the end of October at that time then we can put it into our budget what the state's going to give us and we'll know exactly what our local share is and then um, we can revise our resolution at that point in time but they typically just take the the 80 20 you know the percent split so that's where we're at that'll go to council next week so if you have any questions 
Do we have any questions? I see none. Appreciate it, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Back on to the read night. Greenaway Trail Improvement. Thank you again. Uh, back in January, we applied for some local trail connections dollars from the through the DNR uh, to hopefully overlay some of the Greenway trails that are in need of it. We did not receive funding for that, so uh, just coming back to you guys to see how much uh, how much we're willing to bite off this year for trail improvements. We have the list here on the the packet you received. Uh, it's kind of broken apart into many different pieces. When I've been out traveling the trails, looking at what needs to be done, what's in more severe condition than others, uh, what's in very, very dire condition, that kind of thing, I've put together a priority list. That's in order from one through six, uh, along with the, the dollar amount estimates from Mr. Emery of what it would take to do that. We have uh, right around $89,000 at the end of 2017 in the Greenway Fund. By the end of 2017, we'd have that with what's currently in the, as a balance and then the $45,000 through the end of 2017. So the question would be for, for all of you, um, do we want to move forward on all of the projects as proposed? Um, the total price for all of that that I see is pr pr kind of the highest need for improvement is $117,777. That's uh, from Mr. Emery. He said, m mentioned this morning that may be a little high because he factored some mobilization in since we changed a few of the plans that from what Strata bid on. There are a couple trails that I added uh, this spring or more, more so this summer here in the last month that weren't part of the bid. They are the, both of the Louis Murray Bridge connections on each side. Last fall, when we were kind of going through looking at what needed to be done, I had never even stepped foot on those trails, didn't know they were there. So forgive my, uh, my greenness in that one. But when I got out a little bit this spring and summer, I noticed they were in pretty bad shape. So if it's possible to get those done, I'd even put those as a higher priority than some of the others on the list. Um, so that would be the total there. And then kind of the second total you see under total price improvements on the trail behind the VFW arena, that's the, the high trail more near the arena. It's almost split like in two sections. It must have been done at two different times because one section's in pretty poor shape. The other is okay. Uh, but if we decided we wanted to do it all just to get it all be the same age in recognition that we may have better pricing this year as a final year of the street improvements, um, then we're going to get next year to try to come back and just do that as a single standalone project. That's kind of the thought process here. So the ter determination would be, in summary, if we do it all, we'd have to go in the negative in the Greenway Maintenance Fund until 2019 to allow it to pay itself back. Um, if we're not comfortable doing that, then we will just start with priority one and go as far as what we have available in the Greenway Maintenance Fund takes us. And that's where we'll end and we'll, you know, start biting not off a little bit year by year with what we can afford with that $45,000 we get each year from that fund. Anybody have any questions for Reed? When Mayor? you talk about the Louis Murray uh, segment, is that the, the curved part? Yes. Right off on, and you're saying both sides of the bridge? Both, yeah, both sides. Um, they're they're both in pretty bad shape. If I mean, you're familiar with the trail, fast around there too, so you want them pretty good. Exactly. Yeah. We're kind of off subject here, but we're planning a, a greenway exploration event in September that we're going to ask for people to rollerblade, and that was what brought me to that trail. Is we were going to have them rollerblade that, and there is no way a person could rollerblade on either side of those. They're they're in very very poor shape. So curvy and on a hill. Yeah, it's great. yeah. I, the grade is severe too. Yeah, yeah. It's probably five, six percent around there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. It's good. And and when it, when it breaks up, it breaks up with like little bits of aggregate and stuff too, so you could slip. I know it's asphalt, but it's still little chunks of stuff in there that mm -hmm. could break loose. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have a preference if we go into 2019, or would you want him to go and do what he can do with the money every year? guess what he's asking yeah 
Mr. Demers, you had something? Uh, kind of, yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. I think I've asked this before, but I don't recall the answer. Do we use the pavement management on trails as well? Is that something we could add in the future? Um, I just, part of my question is that obviously it's prioritized, which is nice, but priority doesn't necessarily get to that how degraded is it? Is five that much worse than four? <laughs> you know, obviously it's less than four, but if we left five for two or three years, is that going to be okay or what? Um, and that's not your fault. I mean, it's just, but we do have the tools, the analysis to do that. Um, maybe as we go the next round, we should see if what it would cost to include that. Um, definitely think we, if these are all at needs repair level, I would, I'd be advocating for um, getting as much as we can get done right now for the reason that uh, that was, that was given is you got the pavers, you know, we, you're going to get a price or a good price, I guess. Um, the only other question or the only other thing is I would, I might, <laughs> nobody's going to like me, but I would advocate for not using maintenance, Greenway maintenance dollars for the MinDOT spur, um, that 33000 um, Again, on my maintenance <laughs> soapbox, as the, the purpose of that fund was to perform maintenance on existing trails and not expand. Um, I, th and I know at some point when we were in it, uh, in MPO and and I remember the state saying there was going to be money for that and I know you said that they're looking to see they don't know anything yet but I would before we start allocating at, at a minimum our maintenance but any money I would say let's put the put the screws to them a little bit and see where they can kick up money we we saved them a lot of money on that bridge <laughs> a lot of money so I think they should be able to find thirty thousand dollars to complete the trail. So, but that's my two bits about maintenance and greenway <laughs> maintenance fee. Thank you. I'm I'm for uh, you know getting done. We can get done here. I mean, if we have to go to two nineteen, I'm fine with that. If they're not usable, and let's say next year they're even worse, and we have the opportunity to do it now. It's, it's going to cost us more. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. And just, just to add a little bit of clarity and even to Mr. Demers' comments, I would say, like you say, the priority list doesn't tell you just how poor a shape they're in. But one through four, for sure, are very, very poor. Like weeds coming through the majority of it, tree roots coming through in places, very poor. Um, the section, the 33940 on the trail behind the VFW, that to me is poor enough to do. It, it needs to be redone. The two that are more of a, they're okay this year, they may be okay next year, but three years down the road, we might wish we would have done it, just because then everything is going to be about the same age. If you could recall, last year we did the low section behind the VFW. This will bring nearly that entire thing up to pace, um, or up to the same date. That would be the, the additional 15000 on the trail behind the VFW, and then that trailhead connection. That would, those would be the two that, they don't need it yet, but in a couple of years they may. So if we're, as long as we're going to do it, it may be just best to go and take it all at once. Everybody fine with that? Dad? I, I guess I would concur with Mr. Demers that maintenance funds <laughs> <laughs> should be used for maintenance and only in extreme exceptions to the rule should they be. <laughs> just when you say so. And I would have to agree with that also. <laughs> Anything else to read on That's this? it for that one. Thank you, sir. All right. Senior Center Coordinator, Reed. Yeah. Thank you again, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Anderson, I'm sorry. Ms. Uh, <laughs> Vanderhoof Adams, the Senior Center Coordinator, uh, has indicated that she will plan to retire this fall. She has not given a official written, written notice of retirement, but her basic thought process is, as soon as we have someone in and trained 
to take the position, she will retire. Um, if that happened on September 1st, she'd be ready to retire. If it takes until October or November, I'm crossing my fingers, she'll hold on that long to stay with us and train someone new. So I would appreciate just being able to move forward with opening the hiring process for that to get someone hired as soon as possible. Uh, in looking at just quickly at the budget, I think because the question I'm sure will come of if we can have some transition time to train a new person in the position she has, I think we've got enough room in the budget to have about a month of overlap if we wanted to go that far with Linda staying on and a new coordinator having started to get a little bit of training there. And I've talked to Linda in the past, even last year, about this, and I told her that you know, it, when she came on, she came on fresh. There was nobody there to train her. And I, as I said, the optimal thing is to have somebody here to help somebody transition. And I, I um, made um, um, her say, "Yeah, I'll stay on." You know, and I, I think that's the best thing to do. I think that's you know, for the senior center, make sure we keep providing the service that is being provided now. Um, so, I mean, she's I'm, been nice about it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And she is open. I don't know a lot about it. I didn't have a chance to talk with Mrs. Knudsen about it today, but she is open. She sent me a brochure from the Minnesota Para about a phased retirement. And I have only read the brochure, but she is open to something like that too, where her retirement would become official and, and still work on a part-time basis to help with any transition she can. She's very, very willing and, and looking forward to a new coordinator to be able to share that with. You may have anything, Mark? Uh, yeah, just thank you, Mr. President. Um, i just say um, let's get it at it right away because these type of positions seem like they're some of the hardest to fill, you know, it, it's, it's not many people like Linda that that we find. So um, let's get after it because sometimes these these ones will last longer than we think. So Great. thank you. Anybody else have anything? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, number six, set date for budget work session, Mr. Murphy. Uh, thank you, uh, Council President. Um, in reviewing where we're at um, and what the timeline for getting our budget set and uh, being ready for staff. I would like to set a budget work session date. Uh, I would like to have it not on a work session or a council meeting night. Uh, we are looking at Thursday, August 17th. So I'd like to get approval for that. And bad night. It's my wife's birthday. Oh. <laughs> Maybe you guys want it that way. I get me out of here. <laughs> So if there's, if if there's no objection to that, I, I will put down for August 17th for the... Uh, That's good. All right. Nothing else. I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Pachaminski. Second by Reed. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Meeting is adjourned.